Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway has now sold nearly half of its stake in Apple and when we take a look at their latest results that were released yesterday, we can see at the end of December 2023, they held at a fair value around $174 billion worth of this company. Now in their latest results, so June 2024, they hold around $84 billion. So that is a massive drop. As we said, around 50% of those Apple shares have now been sold. On top of that, when we take a look at their cash, they hold a record level amount of $277 billion. So a few questions we want to ask. Why has he sold Apple stock and what is he planning to do with this massive amount of cash? Now, as we've mentioned, the S&P just on Friday had the worst drop since COVID 2020, wiping around three trillion off the stock market. So could he potentially be looking to buy some undervalued companies? Does he believe that this crash will continue over the next few months? Or does he simply look at Apple as a company that trades at a very high valuation? Right now, we see the forward P at around 30.4, which is above the five-year average of 26.7. So is there that possibility that maybe Warren Buffett sees this valuation as fairly stretched because when we do take a look at Apple's latest earnings that they reported last week, their quarter results have only seen an increase of around 4.8% from the same quarter last year, which as we just said, for a forward P trading around that level, it does seem to be fairly stretched. And when you take a look at the last nine months from June 24 against the same nine months from last year, the top line has only increased by around 0.8%. Yes, you heard that correctly, 0.8%. Now, for a company like Apple, you would think that with the valuation, with the price that continues to climb, that we would maybe see a lot more growth. And what is interesting with this AI-driven narrative with a lot of companies, you would expect that Apple would be at the forefront of that. And while they've talked about releasing Apple intelligence, some of the new features that they talk about in all honesty, it does seem very, very underwhelming. We have improved Siri, which when we're being honest, not many, if any people that I personally know or have seen on social media use Siri at all. We have some new summarization tools for emails and keynotes. And then we also have some Genmoji, a lot of things which I would say in this age of AI, we are expecting a lot of useful features. A lot of these don't seem that great. So a lot of things that we need to consider with this company moving forwards. As we've already said, it does trade at a fairly high valuation for a company which growth doesn't seem to be in that direction or that movement that we want to see. So we want to understand in today's episode, we'll do a quick analysis of this company, get to our valuation and see whether or not we should also be considering selling or maybe actually it still looks undervalued and there is something that has been missed. Over the last 12 months then, it is up around 14%. Over the last 10 years, this is a company that is up 829% and has significantly outperformed the S&P. When we take a look at the performance that does trade at the upper end of the 52-week range, we have a buy signal from Wall Street and they hold from both Seeking Alpha and Quant. As we mentioned, a very high valuation for the growth above 30 and in terms of a yield, it does sit around 0.5%. And we can see all-time highs not too far along. We have seen this in the more recent months, sitting at $237. So let's look under the hood to the underlying metrics. First thing that we want to point out, dividend safety score, 99, very safe, the highest score obtainable. And they did increase the dividend just a few months ago, 4.2%. Pretty poor in my personal opinion. That is keeping up in line with inflation of around 4%, something we would expect to see at a much higher rate for this company. And we can see what this effectively 99 rating means is that a dividend cut for Apple looks extremely unlikely. For those that do believe we're heading into a recession, as we just saw a very large drop, what we can see in the previous recession, 0709, some comparative data, well, they didn't pay a dividend, so nothing to compare. However, they had plus 14% recession sales, well above the average of the S&P at negative 12, but they didn't have a too far off difference in terms of return, negative 50% with the S&P during the same time, negative 55. Nothing too fancy with the dividend growth, 4.2% as we said this year, 7% on average over the last five years, 
and high single digit over the last 10 at 9%. And as we will find out when we look at the balance sheet, they are sitting on a significant amount of cash. They have also been increasing the dividend for the last 11 years. Now, as we mentioned, when we do take a look at this company, not only do we compare the forward P against the five year, but also the dividend and ultimately dividend yield theory tells us a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five year average. So this is a sign of overvaluation. Likewise, when the forward P is above the five year, as we can see, a double undervaluation signal. In fact, you can make that a triple given the information technology as a sector sits much lower at 23.4. Now the yield is very trivial, not something investors come to Apple for, but as consistency on this channel, we'll show you the free cash flow payout. Below 60% is what we wanna see, below 60% is what we get, and in fact, 15% in 23, 30% over the next 12 months, tells us that if they wanted to, they could increase that dividend at a much rapid rate than what we are currently seeing. Now, one thing we always like to note is the free cash flow. And ultimately, we want to see consistent increases over the longer term, something we get with Apple, in fact, more than three times over the last 10 years and expected to continue over the next 12 months. Always a great sign. We can see that trajectory is moving in the way that we want. In terms of sales growth, now this is one area that we just touched upon looking at the more recent quarter as well as the nine month period. What we want to see is three to seven percent growth at a minimum baseline. In fact, three to four percent is just telling us it's increasing in line with inflation. What we can see over the last 10 years, three of them have been negative and unfortunately the more recent year at negative three percent. And as we just saw, looking at the more recent quarter, we don't believe we're going to see a massive growth spurt into 2024. In fact, on a trading 12 month basis, we are seeing zero percent. Now, numerically, when we do look at the last 10 years, we do see some very strong growth. In fact, more than doubled from 2014 to 2023. Although just looking at the last three years, we can see that growth start to stabilize. Now, one thing we love about this company is that they do return a lot of excess cash through those share buybacks. In fact, over the last 10 years, they've bought back nearly 10 billion worth of shares. And that is fairly consistent, something that we do see on a year on year basis. So we do like to note that a bit of a bonus on top of the dividend, but again, very trivial in terms of the growth. Then ROIC, very important metric, 10% or more, give us faith, management are able to effectively allocate their capital. And one of the best results of any company is Apple's ROIC. Just over the last three years, 55 to 65%, 72 on a trading 12 month basis. So that is a very positive sign. When they do reinvest money into this company, they do so at a very high rate, as we can see here. Then when we take a look at the margins, again, very strong, very healthy, well above the minimums 12 that we want to see. We'd like to see this increasing over the longer term. We want to see that operating efficiency like we do when we look at the top line revenue, because ultimately strong companies, high quality companies, they're able to increase both their top line as well as their margins, something that we have seen Nvidia do. So if you want a good example of those metrics, do check out one of our reviews. Free cash flow margin, this is something that we like to see consistent year on year, and it is well above the minimums. In fact, in the upper 20s over the last few years, 27% on a trailing 12 month basis does make it incredibly attractive for potential investors. We then look at the net debt to EBITDA, so the earnings before the interest tax depreciation amortization. What this tells us is one, the dividend safety, two, the balance sheet strength, and ultimately the numbers that you see below, number of years it would take the company to pay off all of their debt net of cash on hand, 0 0.44 in 2023, 0.25 anticipated over the next 12 months. So this company has an incredibly strong balance sheet as we are about to see, and a ton of cash which is one of the reasons why we did say we would have expected a larger increase to the dividend as opposed to one that is just in line with the inflationary rate. Now, one thing we also do within our analysis is look at both insider and institutional movement. Starting off with insider ownership, well, 0.06%. Over the last 12 months, we've seen 183 million worth of sales. However, in terms of buying, we haven't seen any. And when we take a look at the more recent quarter, we see no movement. Going back though to quarter two, we see 61 million worth of sales in 24. And quarter one, we see around 18 million. Now, when we take a look to see who these insiders are, in fact, one thing that we do want to point out for full transparency, even though we do discuss insider sales, we don't really believe it has much of an impact on investment thesis as insiders will sell for many reasons, whether it's personal or financial. Ideally, we want to see insider buying, which we do believe to be very bullish. 
So as we mentioned, 30th of May it was the more recent sale by the director. 75,000 shares of around 14.4 million. But it is something we do like to show you just for that transparency. And then we take a look at the institutional ownership, just above 60%, around 57 billion worth of sales over the last year, with a lot more, in fact, nearly double the amount of buying during the same time period. When we take a look at quarter two, we also notice that same theme, double the amount of buyers and sells. However, in quarter one, we see a lot more selling than buying. Going back one more quarter, we see the complete opposite. So in summary, institutions, they are buying more than they are selling, as we can see in the more recent quarter. Insiders, though, it is the opposite, a lot of selling. But as always, regardless, insiders, institutions, buyers or sells, do your own due diligence and never rely on any of their movements. So now let's take a look at the income statement. Now we did touch upon the top line revenue. As we did say, nice growth over the last 10 years. In fact, double during the period. But we did point out the last three years, it does look to be slowing down. And one thing that we want to talk about as well is the bottom line net income. What story can be told there? And while we look at it from a graphical perspective, it has increased over the long term, a lot more inconsistent. And in fact, the last three years mirroring the top line revenue, looking fairly flat, minimal growth. When we zoom out though, we can see nearly three times growth over the last 10 years. But again, over the last three years, 95 billion in 21, 99.8 in 22, 97 in 2023. So something just to factor into the analysis, it doesn't mean that Apple isn't a company to have in the portfolio. It just means that you need to be considering buying this if it's one you want to consider at a reasonable valuation that does reflect the growth that it does currently have. Then we want to take a look at the health of the company, their total cash and short term investments versus total debt, going from around 25 billion, as we can see in 2014, to around 62 in the latest quarter. So it has increased more than double, a little bit inconsistent, but over the wider period, we do notice the growth. Always remember, though, any number that we look at in isolation doesn't tell us anything. So when we do compare it to their total debt numerically and directionally, we can see 35 billion in 2014 to around 101 billion in the latest quarter. So that is massive growth to their total debt, a lot higher than their total cash. One thing that we can say, though, from the highs of 2021, it has started to reduce. So it went from around 124 billion in September 23 to seeing around 101. Now, it does still look secure. As we saw in the net debt to EBITDA, it is well below, in fact, one. So that is a positive sign, but just something to keep an eye on. Hopefully, it does continue to come down, and they do have right now a respectable amount of cash and short-term investment. Now, before we move on, we just want to let you know we have released our latest weekly article. If you want access to this or any others, you can grab a copy by clicking on the pinned comment below. And we have also released our 35 undervalued stocks to consider in August. And you can go through each one. We talk about the value that we believe, the upside as well, and also those that we are currently holding within our own portfolio. Next thing we want to discuss is the earnings. Now, we always like to look at how they've performed against expectations and moving forwards projections. Four out of four. So over the last four quarters, they have beaten on the EPS. Always a great sign, 100%. Gives us faith when looking forwards that they will be able to hit these estimates. And we do note for the next four quarters, they are anticipating high single digit to low double digit growth. If they do ultimately hit the September 2025 EPS estimate, the forward P will come down still pretty high at around 29.62 and again still above that five year average. We then want to just run through some underlining metrics as well as the gradings. The first one is an F. Now, ultimately, what this means, whilst we like to point out the P on a non gap basis moving forwards, we can see that whichever valuation metric you use, this company is trading at a massive premium to the sector median. In fact, just on the P alone, with the sector median around 23, if you are buying Apple at this price, you are paying a 44.25% premium. Now, as always, sometimes it is justified, it is warranted, and we can also incorporate a margin of safety into our valuation shortly as well. Unfortunately, though, on the growth, it doesn't look that great. They get a degrade year on year, 0.43%. As we said, we want to see much larger numbers for a company that is essentially valued at above 30 on a forward P basis. Sector median is higher, even though it is low single digit, still 3.6% pretty much in line with inflation, whereas Apple's is lower. On a forward-looking basis, 2.04%. Again, pretty poor. Sector median is also higher at 672 And when we look to the earnings per share over the next three to five years, 
Apple is anticipating 11% growth where the sector is 14.4. So a very reasonable question to ask is why exactly would you be paying for a company like Apple when we can see the growth metrics look very poor in relation to the sector and they trade at a premium. Well, one of the aspects that Apple do very well, as we're about to see, is the profitability. They get an A+. Now, when we look at the gross profit margin, it does sit a little bit lower, 46% against the sector median of 49.2. But their bottom line is fantastic, 26% with the sector median at 3.22. And then couple that with their cash from operations, 113 billion, as opposed to the sector median of 100.2 million. So a lot of things to incorporate into your analysis. We get one buy rating from Wall Street, a double hold from the other analysts, an F on valuation, a D on growth, with an A plus on profitability. Now we also wanna understand how well or how poorly have they performed against others in the sector. Now for some comparisons, we have Dell Technologies and we have a few others that are very well known. And what we can see ultimately, this is a company that is up 15%. And that is one of the worst performing from the comparatives over the last year and including dividends reinvested. Over the last five years, we can see it is one of the best performing, although it is overshadowed by SMCI around 3,600%. And over the last 10 years, again, very respectable performance, 944%. But as always, whether you think this is good enough for your portfolio or not based on the historical data, past performance is never an indicator of future performance. Now, before we jump in, this is the final thing that we just want to mention. When you do invest in a company, always think to yourself, will it outform the S&P over the longer term, over your essential investment horizon? If not, low-cost ETFs may be the way to go, especially if you're struggling to have that confidence in a particular company. So over the last year, we do see that Apple has marginally underperformed the S&P, 15% versus 18%. When we expand this over the last five years, we see the opposite significant outperformance of Apple at 347%. And over the last 10 years, again, we can see that Apple has been an incredibly strong company. But always ask yourself, do you believe this happening again over the next 10 years? Now we're going to jump into the valuation model. As always, if you do enjoy the content, value is being provided. Smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. And our intrinsic value today comes at $207. Now how we got to this value, we effectively put it through the DCF model where we have the free cash flow year on year. We have the average growth rate over the last 10 years at 10%. And forward looking, we have gone for that 10% in our model. Using our discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get the equity value, divide by the shares outstanding, and we get that intrinsic value, which shows us overvaluation. And based on this here, we have downside of 6%. Now, a lot of people will say that is way too conservative. You see AI really helping Apple in the future. So you want to go a bit higher at around 12%. If you believe that is way too conservative, we can see here that by using 12%, you would get upside of around 8%. And if you use 14%, if you wanted to be even more optimistic, you would get upside around 24% with value of $273. As always, though, you can grab a copy of this model by clicking on the pinned comment below and running in your own numbers, whether it's for Apple or any other company on your watch list or in your portfolio. So let's take this through to the intrinsic value calculation. And as it's just the one model today at $207, with the current price at 220, we believe right now that Apple is trading above its fair value. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you should sell it, but what we're seeing here right now that if you wanted a margin of safety, you would have to wait for much lower. As always, on this channel, we use a 10 cent MOS and we execute on this if it meets our three golden criteria, a wide moat, strong financial metrics and good forward looking data. If you believe this today, well, it is a buy around $186. So you would have to wait before triggering on that price. A lot of people will say, you know, it is a high quality company and they're happy to wait for just a 5 cent MOS. Well, that would be around $196. And again, there will be others in the crowd who are happy to buy it at its fair value. And that sits, as we said, around $207. Ultimately, though, Wall Street are in complete disagreement. They have a price target of $247 over the next year. They do believe this is a buy, as we saw in the rating, and they have upside of 12%. As always, though, do let us know your thoughts in the comments below. 
Is this one that actually you do believe has a lot more upside you are looking to buy? Maybe it's on the watch list. Maybe you own it and you just want to hold it for the time being. Or maybe actually this is one like Warren Buffett you are considering selling. As always, if you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop. Don't forget to click on the pinned comment below where you can sign up to the free weekly newsletter. And also if you want to join us in the Patreon where we do discuss our weekly buys and sells. As always, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Have a great day and we'll see you all on the next one.